and his theme today is Hope of the Young. And I was reading a few of the notes that were provided with Father's shortened CV and was struck by an unfortunate similarity, I think. So many areas of concern that we in New Zealand have in common with Father Riley. Our newspapers and other media relay an almost daily litany of offences against, to, and by our young people, particularly young men, some as young as 12 being charged with capital offences. It's easy to lose hope and to turn away and say, that is not my affair, wring one's hands, but it's wise to remind ourselves that these are children of our own generation. These are our children. Father Riley has spent his lifetime, his priestly lifetime, caring for the young of others. And looking at his CV, one sees an absolute dedication to improving his knowledge and his professional expertise to enable him to properly execute his ministry. He's a trained primary and secondary teacher. He has a Bachelor of Theology degree from Melbourne College of Divinity. He has a BA majoring in Sociology and English from Monash University. He has a, a Diploma of Abuse Counselling from the Australian Institute of Professional Counsellors. He has a Diploma in Psychology from the Applied School of Psychology in Sydney. When I look through what Father Riley does and how, how he does it absolutely escapes me because he is picking up in Australia more than some of the problems that we are facing in New Zealand. But these are some of our children's children and some of our children. The problems we have, we have in common with Father Riley. I think, I think he's an absolute saint. Father Chris Riley. Thank you for that welcome, and it's good to be over here. I, haven't, uh, I do look after a lot of your bloody kids over in Australia, I have to say. <laughs> There's stacks of them over there and causing all sorts of troubles for me. I'm a, uh, I noticed they had my initials after my name in your program as AM. That's not my religious congregation, that's the Australian uh, medal. My religious congregation is Salesian. SDB, and we, uh, we actually were t um, coming to existence to work with marginalised and disadvantaged young people. And I really, I'm really lucky. When you look at the young people around today, they don't really know where they're going. Whereas I saw Boys Town, the old Boys Town movie when I was 14, and said then, I'm going to be a priest to work with kids like they had at Boys Town. And because I was so shy and introverted, and live with my animals more than people and would run out the back door when visitors came, my mum and dad decided I needed to go to boarding school. And they sent me to a boarding school that was recommended by the nuns who taught me because it was cheap. It was $120 and we weren't very rich. And three months after being in that boarding school, I was just playing footy and um, this big blue bus came in with Boys Town on it. I'm thinking, what the hell is this? And I said, what's this? And the brothers who were teaching me said, we own Boys Town in Sydney. And so I said, that's where I'm going at the age of 15. And my mum's not Catholic, so I said to mum, I'm becoming a priest. And she said, I won't ever speak to you again. <laughs> and I said, it, and I said it, she would just, ju just pick me up from a dance. And I said, I can live with that because I know where I'm going. And she begged me and my dad begged me to take a year off. And I said, I know where I'm going, I've got to do it. And so I had this on by the time I was 18. And on my 21st birthday, I was sent to Boys Town at Angadine in Sydney, where I worked for a couple of years, then went back to study theology, become a priest after being a brother for eight or nine years. And then in 86, I was sent back to Boys Town as principal. 
And Boys Town had changed a lot since then. It only had kids there on during the week. They had to go home for school holidays and weekends. And I'm thinking, well, I've never had a weekend off. What, what am I going to do with this? And I saw one priest go sailing, another one go bike riding, another one play golf. And I'm thinking, I can't do that. So I started going in on the streets to work with what we call hardcore street kids in Sydney, with a group of kids that were unreachable, so people said. All the charity food vans would not go there because of the high level of violence with this group of young kids, or sorry, older teenagers, 16 to 19, 20. I just clicked with them like that. And one day I went out to the streets and I was looking for a kid, it was pouring rain. It had been raining for about three weeks solid. And I saw this kid that I was looking for asleep on the bench. And I, set, I shook him very gently because you'll get a punch in the mouth if you do it too quickly because they're so used to being attacked. You go up and attack someone on the street, you get sort of whacked. So I very gently said, do you want something to eat? And he said, don't worry about me. I'm not worth it. And that just that thought just sat so powerfully with me that this kid believes he didn't even have, deserve a bit of food. And I dragged his feet off the bench and pulled him up towards me and he towered over me. And he stood there like this, shivering. And then tears started to come down his face. And I said to him, I was really concerned, because I'd seen this kid with bloody knuckles. He'd been taking on police. He'd been in police vans. I'd seen him in absolute violence. I never saw him cry. So I kept saying to him, what's wrong with you? And he kept saying, don't worry about me, I'm just cold. And after a few, few minutes of me questioning him, it suddenly hit me that this kid was crying simply because he was cold. And as I stood there, I kept thinking, I never knew there was such a pain as sharp as a knife slicing your flesh that came about because of simple coldness. And I said to him, I'm going to take you to a hotel. And again, he said, don't waste your money. And I said, it's a cheap hotel. It's not going to cost me much. <laughs> it's uh, going to cost 27 bucks. Just go and do it. And he got in a car with me, and I gave him the $27 to go into this uh, cheap hotel. And I was thinking, he's going to nick off and buy drugs with it, but I don't care, really. But he didn't. He went in, and he got this warm. And the next night I saw him, he was full of life again because he had at least had one night, at least in a warm bed, in a real bed. And at that time, I made a commitment that I would go back to Boys Town, I would teach all day, I'd put the bed, kids into bed, and by 11 o'clock I would be, get an older priest to go and sit there and say so, in case something went wrong, and I would fly off every night into Sydney, the streets of Sydney, which was an hour from Boys Town, just to feed and to be with these kids who literally had nothing. At the end of the uh, 1990, after lots and lots of pressure on my superiors and an edict that came down from Rome saying that each of our provinces had to have a work with street kids, I was released from Boys Town as principal to be able to go and work on the streets of Sydney with the hardcore kids. And over that, that last 18 years, we've looked, over, over, looked after over 100,000 kids. And we are now working in communities where the... Um, <laughs> we're now working in very troubled communities. And I don't, don't know if you see any, I don't know if that, did, that, did we send any DVDs over? John, did we? No DVDs. So one of the, uh, one of the what, we, what we do, and this is where I'm looking after all your kids, in southwest Sydney, uh, we've got a real presence there. And I guess, I don't know if you've heard of the Macquarie Fields riots, but it was after a, two kids were killed in a high-speed car chase. And they were actually, as a response, the whole group got up and started fighting the police for three days. Just unleashed violence, throwing bricks and tearing out street signs and hurling at police. And I was asked on radio and TV to comment on this, and I said, the police should be given whatever powers necessary to stop this nonsense now. It was fuelled by alcohol, and I think people were a bit shocked that I took that line because I think what they expected me to do was to defend the kids. You can't defend bad behaviour, and you look pretty foolish if you do try that. But I also said to the Premier at the time, who uh, didn't like me at all, 
because I would attack him in every church I went to and every radio station, I would be attacking him for his policy on youth, youth. And I think today, when we're talking about hope, we need to examine very clearly the policies and practices around the way we look after our kids. We in Australia do it so badly. And as a result, escalating levels of violence, suicide, uh, gang-related activity and crime and drugs. And I said to the Premier, when the police do their job, people like me need to do our job to make sure that suburb never has a riot again. And I said to him, Bob Carr was his name, I said, Bob, through the TV, give me four million bucks and I'll fix your problem in 12 months. And he said, as traditional politicians do, probably over here as well, we'll do an audit of what Macquarie Field needs and then we'll let you know. And I said, well, I've written you a 16-page letter telling you exactly what this community needs. And so because I've been so outspoken, I said, well, I'm going to have to go in there without the money to make sure that we, uh, I put my actions, words into action. Are you, being Australian, are you understanding me? Because I speak fast sometimes. My Indonesian friends say, um, when I went to Aceh, they said, priests in Indonesia are taught to speak slowly. And I said, I've got too much to say, I can't go too slowly. <laughs> and I've only got a certain amount of time. We went into that suburb where these kids were out of control. And we found good kids in these housing estates that had very little infrastructure, uh, nothing for kids to do. And so they would get bored and see fighting police as a bit of a game. After we went in there, we found some kids involved in the riot who had no, no previous criminal history, were only there for a couple of hours. And I decided that we needed to get them in such a way that they don't go to jail. Because every magistrate was going to jail every kid who was doing riot and affray. And we had quite a few of them in Australia over the last three years. And I decided one of the best things, and I think we as a church and we as a nation, the one thing we can give kids is the ability to contribute to society. We exclude kids from everything in Australia. And I've even gone as far as to say lately, maybe this thing called adolescence is a figment of our imagination. And if you think back to when the First and Second World War was on, the kids of 15, 16 in Australia, and probably in New Zealand as well, were hiding their age because they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to go and defend their country. And what we say to them now is, you're adolescents. You're nothing, really. You're not adults. You can't contribute. And what we do is what we call service learning. And it's where every kid in every one of our programs every week has to volunteer. And my kids are now saying things like, we love volunteering. When you take, and you, you may not believe this, you might think Australians are mad, but we actually get disabled, severely disabled kids given to us for our kids to take away and look after for three or four days. Can you imagine what it's like to see our kids being looked up to as something special? How that would change them. I went into the Minister for Emergency Services the other day and I said to him, people think I'm mad on a couple of things, lots of things probably. And I said, they think I'm mad because I want my own fire engine. And he said, why do you want that? I said, can you imagine those kids involved in the riot, a bushfire in their area, they get on that truck, they go out and fight that fire. What are they gonna feel like when the community just gives them an amazing applause when they drive up their, their main street after defending their, their community. These kids change. And when I went to Arche, I remember one of my kids, I, I had got him off the streets as a heroin addict. Uh, he'd been to East Timor with me, he'd been to Albania with me, and when he saw me going to Arche, he said to me, rang and said, I'm coming with you. I said, not this time, Will. And he said, why not? I said, well, I didn't realise it, but Catholic priests are fairly rare in Arche. I didn't realise it till I went there. And someone said, get that padre off because you might get shot. And then I said, there are also freedom fighters over there who are trying to become independent. So they're dangerous as well. And there's bodies everywhere that the dogs are eating and there's uh, just so much disease, I can't take you. And he said to me, you are a hypocrite. 
And I said to him, oh, yeah, sure. How am I? And he said, well, remember when you taught me HSC English? He said, you quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you said this, if a man hasn't got something worth dying for, then his life is not worth living. And I said, Will, really? Are you prepared to die over this? He said, yes, I am. And so I said, get on a plane and let's go. And he came over there and worked there. And just seeing what he did in terms of setting up uh, this, um, this special youth uh, orphanage that we set up in Archade. And it's taken us a long time, but we got into it. And I don't know why others don't do it like we did it. This naive little Catholic priest goes over there thinking, yeah, sure. And I create sensation wherever I go. And then I look around thinking, I've started this, but where do I go from here? I've got, <laughs> wouldn't have a clue. And all of a sudden people gather around me and it's a real belief. I just think one of the greatest blessings I have is no matter how bad or how incompetent I am, God never gives up on me. He just supports me the whole time. And I just keep thinking, you know, I've just got to do my little bit and God's certainly going to support me. And I took the Macquarie Fields boys over to a place in the Philippines. And I went into a jail. And I don't know if any of you have heard of Father Shea Cullen. He's a Columban priest in the, in the Philippines. He has about 40 allegations against him for abusing children because he takes everyone on. And he just says, I don't know why he's not dead. I mean, he is just such the most courageous man I've ever met. And he just fights for the rights of children. And those people who hurt children will attack us by accusing us of being abusers. And he just doesn't worry, he just drives through and I just keep thinking, why aren't you dead? There must be so many people out there who hate you. And yet there's so many people out there who are saved by him and loved by him. So he had gone into the Filipino jails two weeks before I arrived with a CNN camera. And as I was arriving, right across the world, Philippine jails and the conditions these people lived in. And I hear this every day uh, of my life, I have to say, and even though I've been doing this for 34 years, I can't get used to it. In that CNN report, I see a prisoner looking down the barrel of the camera saying, see that eight-year-old kid there? We get him whenever we want. And that just, just sends a chill down my, my spine, I have to say, because in Australia, and I don't know over here, child abuse in some of our communities is simply taken for granted and is accepted. And I just get so upset about that. So when I went in there, I'm thinking, why are they letting me in when Father Shea has really put the spotlight on? What they had done was they had made a few changes that they thought I might be able to comment on. And I wasn't going in there to expose them, I was going in there to work with them. What they had done is there's a cell just to the front of the stage. In that cell, one tap, one toilet, concrete floor, 31 kids. That was it, in that cell. When my Macquarie Fields boys, these big tough rioters, went in there, I saw tears starting to well in their eyes. And the Filipino kids, like most kids in those third world countries, have so much resilience. And rather than letting the Australian kids get upset, they started singing songs with, to them started dancing and playing with them. And our kids just were embraced by them. And these are kids in Australia who are told you are worthless. You live in the worst possible suburb in this country. If you put down your real address, you will never even get a job interview, let alone a job. We hate you as a, as a suburb. These kids go in and their experience is that they are able to make a difference. And when they, before they left, I gave them $50 saying, and these are kids who are an hour from the Harbour Bridge, a bit better than your Harbour Bridge, I have to say, <laughs> a bit bigger, not, not better because you actually take hours to get over hours, there's so much traffic. But they have an hour from the Harbour Bridge, most of these kids have not seen it at 19. You don't cross certain suburbs in our tough areas because if you do, you're going to meet another gang you're going to be in trouble with. So I said to them, they'd never been on a plane or overseas. I gave them 50 bucks and said, please buy your mum something. Uh, one of the biggest indicators of a boy's getting into trouble, by the way, is not having a father. And in that suburb, 60% of the kids do not have a father. So it's not surprising that they're, they're so troubled. So, but they do have mums who, and research, by the way, you can tell parents, research that we're doing at the moment indicates that 
footballers, movie stars, when it comes to influencing, right down low. Our research recently showed mums are the heroes of their kids. You've got to get that. You've got to get that. Because a lot of people think they're so difficult, they don't want to be around, they don't want me. I keep saying kids are hardwired to please adults. And these kids were. So I gave them the 50 bucks to buy the mum a present, and I left a day early. When they came back, the youth worker who was with them rushed to me and said, you know what they spent that 50 bucks on? You know, you, even in the poorest of the countries, you know what's in duty free? Grog, cigarettes, perfume. And I said, I hope they didn't buy grog or cigarettes. And he said, no, no, they went, pooled their money and went and bought little pillows and, and mattresses and blankets for the kids in the jail and took it back for them. And one kid came up to me and he said, Father, where I live isn't so bad now. And I said, you can't compare poverty, compared to Sydney, to compared to in Australia, you live in poverty in Macquarie Fields with about a 30% unemployment rate when the nation's unemployment rate is, five, is 4%. 4 point something percent. But he said something more important than that. He said to me, I know now that I can make a difference. And I, for some reason, said to him, would you like to be a trainee youth worker? He said, yes, with the, other, with the other ones. Yeah, we would. And I think, what have I just said? I have no idea what a trainee youth worker is. <laughs> so I'm going to have to come up with something to uh, follow through. In three months' time, they will graduate with their certificate four in youth work. And I stress to them, if you think that's enough for me, you're dreaming. Diploma, university, you have to read, you have to work hard at this job. I'm still studying degrees. I read about five books a week because the older I get, the less I know. And kids are thrown at me all the time with different needs. Those kids have saved this suburb. First anniversary, second anniversary, the riots could have been in trouble. These kids talked it down. And I think the last time I had a, speak, had a session with the area commander, he said Macquarie Fields, which is one suburb, crime rate is down by 30%. The other suburbs, where all your kids are, I have to say, the other suburbs are down 4%. And I, I'm quite serious about your kids. We have real issues with Islander kids. I call them Islander kids, and that, that goes with Maoris and Tongans and Samoans. Islander kids over in those suburbs cause massive trouble in terms of gang-related activity, and we're certainly working with them. I just wish I had a few Islander staff over there because it's really clear that you have to start out over there with an Islander staff member to be able to understand and get through to them. But you can change suburbs by lifting kids up. Imagine what it would be like if you felt you had no way to contribute. What would your life really be like? So would I be surprised at young Bo Jesse at the age of 13 when I pull up in that suburb at 9.30 in the morning, school morning, sitting in a gutter with a bottle of Jack Daniels? No, I'm not surprised. This kid can't read. He's got no aspirations. He doesn't believe he's good enough to contribute to anything. And so if we as church, we as community, need to lift our kids up, we need to let them know that they can make a difference. We need to challenge them to give. And Sir William Dean, I don't know if you know Sir William Dean, he's our patron, but he's also, I think, the greatest Governor-General Australia has ever had. And the, you can tell he's the greatest Governor-General because the Prime Minister hated him. He would speak out. Nothing would stop him. He'd speak out for Aboriginal people. He'd speak out for street kids. He'd speak out for the marginalised. He was Catholic. And I believe we, if you're truly Catholic, truly Christian, you must be a voice for those who have no voice. And if people don't like you because of it, big deal. Who really cares? And I guess I keep focusing on the cross of a God who broke down uh, and broke into our humanity, was killed for us, very unpopular, where people cursed him and hated him and crucified him, and he challenges us to walk his way. That doesn't mean we have to be popular. And I think a church that strives to be popular is a very, very dangerous church. And one of my greatest heroes that I would speak about is Martin Luther King Jr., but also Bishop Oscar Romero, who, if anyone knows anything about him, he was a church mouse of a bishop when he was ordained. He was for the status quo. He would hide in his little flat, sick and snivelling, reading books. 
until one day someone walked into a big function where he was with all the celebrities, with all the powerful people, and this man walked in, a priest said, three of your priests have been killed today. This man changed. He stormed out of that gathering, refused to go to official functions because it was the system that was corrupt. Violence just doesn't happen out there on the streets. We have an institutionalised violence around this world where we accept it, we glorify it tragically too often. Some of the stuff we see, we just glorify it. Some of the songs we hear, I mean, the rap stuff, which I've had to listen to, by the way, I've really been, I've kept away from rap for so long, but I just think it's a language of kids. If we want to be serious, we have to listen to that to learn how they're feeling but to lead them away from that. You never allow them to wallow in garbage. You, our job is to lead them away from that by encouraging them and giving them some sort of option. I know, I, I don't know too much about this country at all, but I guess like all countries, we're, our kids are all in trouble. I will fight things like policy and procedure from people with things like when the Premier would come out and say, when we catch those fire lighters, those little buggers who, who lit those fires, I will humiliate, degrade and traumatise them. And I will go on TV or radio and say this, do you understand where those kids come from very often? Do you understand the rage in that? And if they're doing terrible things, they're doing it because something's terrible being done to them, we have to fix what is being done to them so they never fight light fires again. But if you humiliate, degrade and traumatise them, the response you'll get will be greater violence. If I started yelling at John, telling him what a mongrel he was and how awful he was, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say thank you. He'd want, to, he'd want to punch me out. Making someone feel bad doesn't help them be good. And it's really important we get that. And I, I guess a lot of the communities I'm dealing with from, your, from the island is an intense, in, ingrained violence. I got a call about a group of violent kids in Bankstown, which is a really troubled area with a lot of Muslims in it as well. And the MP said to me, I can't believe it. These kids have stabbed someone and they were in church two hours beforehand. I said, do you know what church means for them? They have to go. They have to go for long hours. They talk about peace and kindness and forgiveness. They go home and come home a half an hour late and beaten up. And so they go out in the streets and they beat others up because that's what has been modelled. And I keep saying to people, we've got to get it. Kids may not listen to adults, but they do what adults do. And we get shocked that there's drinking, binge drinking. Well, we model. Any celebration has to be people get drunk in our country. And we've just got to understand it. And I'll say this to finish with this story in terms of why we've got to understand. And I keep saying to people, behaviour is language. Do you understand when a kid is acting out, he's trying to tell us something? He can't put it into words, but we have to work out what he's trying to say. And so I'll give you an example of that, and I'll give you an example of where the rage in so many of our kids, and I guess your kids, come from. And I'd be foolish to say that you're in a, in a land of dreams. I know you will hear stories about every country, and I think ours is one of the worst, to be honest, the way we treat our kids. This young man came into my classroom and I have a reputation. You don't back answer me. You don't swear. I don't swear at people. You don't yell and you do your work. And I'm really lucky that kids tell the new kids about me before I get into the classroom. I think that's great. They will say, if he touches his collar, run like hell because he's gonna start, <laughs> he's gonna start screaming and swearing. And I never scream, I never swear, but I like the myth, so you go in, Kids are all there, really good, and they like the structure. They feel after the first, once they survive the first day, they love it because they know they're going to achieve something. But this big kid, a 14 year old, six foot, I came in and he had been told the stories about me. He had decided he was going to take no notice. <laughs> so I walked in and he, I said, you can do your spelling. And if you get a spelling word wrong, I said to my class, I said, I love you guys so much that every word you get wrong, I'll give you an opportunity during recreation to write it out 50 times. Well, this kid said to me, your programs are F'd and you can go and get F with your spelling. Oh, no. I just turned 50, I think, the day before or something. I'm thinking, I'm too old for this. 
And I said to him, well, you can go and pack your bags and I'll drive you to the nearest detention centre because this is not a jail. You don't have to be here. And I don't want you here if you're going to be, have that attitude. So he stormed off and I stormed off. And this saying jumped in my head, behaviour is language. What is this kid trying to tell me? So I went and read his file and I knew exactly what he was telling me in five minutes. At the age of eight, this young boy had seen his dad shoot his mum to death in front of him. The dad then turned the gun on himself and shot himself in front of this eight-year-old who had been sexually assaulted by the father from the age of three to eight. And this father raged in, ruled the family in rage. He'd blocked in every window in the house. So the family didn't know if it was night or day, which day, which, which week, which month. He would turn on the lights when he wanted to control and terrorise them. So the kid's message to me was pretty clear. My mum and dad are the two people who should have loved me most have let me down. So why would I trust any other adult? So I went to one of my Aboriginal staff members and I said, whatever happens today, this kid cannot leave us. He has been passed from one person to another and we're going to take a stand. We're going to take whatever he throws at us. And the youth worker said, what if I take him out in the bush? I said, oh yes, please. It'll save my walls, my doors, my windows. He was going into staff members with a knife and saying to my teachers, getting a pair of scissors, saying, someone's going to die here today. I said, my teachers will put up with that for a week maybe, but it's going to be wearing. And so they took him out in the bush with these words to the youth worker. Whatever you do, this is not a party. Get into his head. Make him process his pain that he hadn't spoken about to anyone for eight years. And so off he went, and when he, after three days, this youth worker was ringing me saying, everything's coming out. And I keep thinking, and I've just got to give this message to everyone, no matter how damaged a young person is, with patience, time, and the right touch, you can reclaim them. And so after three or four months, this kid ends up in my classroom again. So I walk in thinking, I hope I don't have to go through this again. And I said, Ben, sit down and do your spelling. He looked up at me, great smile and said yes father and I just felt that is a story that we have to continually if kids are doing something bad if kids are acting out then there's a story behind that tragically in Australia of those, of those over 100,000 kids that I've dealt with 95% of the girls and 90% of the boys have been sexually assaulted it is the worst thing that can happen to kids two of my good friends from this country a 36 and 37 year old, very highly professional people. One's probably one of the most famous actors in, in, Austra in Australia, just finished a run. Another one works for an advertising company, I, it's all over here. I, he gets about 400,000 a year. Both those men have come to me with absolute abuse that happened to them. In one particular case with one of them, he was involved in a pedophile ring from six to 10 with his mother's knowledge and the other one was uh, hurt in a, a Christian camp. We've got to know this is happening to our kids and I speak strongly about this and don't apologise for it because our kids are hurting like hell and only we can help them. And I guess what I invite churches and groups to do is families are being destroyed. The only way we can rebuild is by creating extended families, by saying, Okay, and we've got some Aboriginal girls. Where they, when your extended family is gone, who teaches you how to be a mum or a dad? Who teaches you those things? Aboriginal cultures, it was every child is a responsibility of every adult. Those communities are so fractured by division and alcohol uh, that kids are no longer safe in those communities. We have to create uh, extended families in those. I kept saying to people, do you know a kid in your street that's in trouble? The whole street should have come together to work out a strategy to help that kid. And so today I just really ask you to think seriously about being a voice for the church and for the broken. And I really believe passionately that if we don't respond to those who are disadvantaged, we aren't doing our job as Christians or Catholics. We are enriched by meeting the poor. And are the poor easy all the time? No, they're bloody hard work sometimes. It just fly, it's tough work where they will, I was at Macquarie Fields for Christmas, they were trying to steal the presents I gave them. <laughs> trying to break into my horse float to get my, get my um, 
present. More, and then one girl came up and said, we didn't get a present, Father. I said, okay, I'll try and find something. And one of the youth workers came up, she did. And I just said, you are so selfish, you know. You just want and want, I only got 25 gift voucher. I'm thinking, I'm not your parent. 25 gift dollars of gift voucher is not a bad present from a, from a stranger in a sense. And so they aren't, I guess, very um, grateful. The other thing I think I've taken on is uh, the division between religions. And I recently was, um, being in Aceh, I have a fairly strong affiliation with the Muslims over there. And I was sent to a community on Australia Day that was anti-Muslim and, and there's a Reverend Fred Nile, who's a politician, had gone into that town with 600 people in a hall like this and denounced Muslims. And they were fearing there was going to be a riot there on Australia Day. And I'm thinking, here I am, I'm lucky to be the Australian Day ambassador to this town. But he, what he did, I just can't see how anyone can do it. When you look at Jesus Christ, there's no angle that I can find that encourages hatred from him, hatred of anyone. And again, we need to stand firm that people do not manipulate Jesus Christ to be a, an instrument of hate. And I spoke out very strongly. And it came up on the newspaper after I come back, Riley slams Nile. And it was this, the God of hate. We cannot use Jesus Christ as a God of hate. We have to, I guess, the things that I'm judged on, and I think I think, go to Matthew 25, I think it's the only passage I know, but it says, did you feed the hungry? Did you visit prisoners? And I make sure I do those things. Do you go and visit the lonely? I mean, do you, in this country, for example, we ha we're such a great networking country, an old lady can die in a house and no one knows for a year later. Do you have that sort of stuff? The, the aloneness and the isolation in our community. We need to be challenged to connect our communities. And Christ certainly did that. Uh, I'll quote, finish off with this quote, who is, um, as I said, one of my greatest heroes, Oscar, Oscar Romero. He said, how I would like to engrave this great idea on each one's heart. Christianity is not a collection of truths to be believed, of laws to be obeyed, of prohibitions, that makes it very distasteful. Christianity is a person, one who loves so much, one who calls for our love. Christianity is Christ. And I really challenge you today to take that seriously. I was with the Cardinal the other day and a lot of people think the Cardinal and I would not get on. We come from miles apart, he's very conservative, and, but we get on so well. He just um, is, we, we're good friends. But he, unfortunately, is in a room with me. Whenever he's with me, I'm speaking. So he's my prime target. He said to me, I was in trouble in one town because I described it as racist. I mean, uh, two Aboriginal boys uh, hit two punches and killed a, a, a white kid. And all hell broke loose, and it should have, I guess. But um, when I went to that town, I said racism was behind that and racism is entrenched in our community. And I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow and talk a bit more around the theory of that. But that, therefore I was hated. The mayor thought I was the worst. And then I exposed a group of Aboriginal girls from ages 11 to 16 who at three in the morning were going up to, to be prostitutes. And I said, that's not prostitution, it's child abuse. And it's happening in your perfect little town. So again, I wasn't very popular. So a group wrote to the Cardinal complaining about me. And he wrote back, he has no jurisdiction over me, and I, make that, I let him know that all the time. <laughs> and he said, although Father Riley is not a member of the Sydney Diocese, and although he lacks some diplomatic skills, <laughs> he has my full support. So whenever I see the Cardinal, I said, isn't that the pot calling the kettle black here? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're renowned for your um, lack of diplomatic skills. And, and he can laugh about that. But I then go on to say to him, and that's exactly why I admire you, because you will speak out. And we do need people to speak out for the truth, and it doesn't make us popular. And if you think popularity is the only thing that's worth having, again, look at the cross. I spoke at the, uh, the cross the other day in Macquarie Fields as they're building up towards World Youth Day. It's something, a cross is not just a symbol, it's a lifestyle that we have to embrace. It's about challenge. It's about standing up for those who have no voice. And I guess if nothing else happens, what did happen with me going to boarding school from that little shy person who wouldn't say boo in front of everyone, 
I got this on by the time I was 18, and I haven't shut up since. And I just keep driving this home that our kids are precious and we've got to stand up for them. And it's something that we as Christians uh, have no choice but to do when it comes to defending the marginalised. I'm happy to answer a question. I've got two minutes. I'm running in a very strange style. I had my Australian watch on. So I was, I was about to get into a taxi thingy. It's half past one. And then I saw the hotel and I thought, I hadn't put this one on. <laughs> because I was actually waiting on the plane. They were saying, welcome to New Zealand. Blah, blah, blah. They always say on other planes. And the time, the local time now is, never said it. So I put it in my pocket and forgot about my New Zealand time. So I've got five minutes if you did want to ask. And if you did want to ask a question, there's a microphone here, I think. Um, if you want to ask a question, just come up here and you can ask other questions here. Or you can yell. No, they just want me to shut up, I think. Our strategy is so simple. At Macquarie Fields, where we have the, what, the so-called worst, the worst, and they're not, we set up, a, we didn't even set it up, it was an old basketball court in the middle of town, the basketball rings aren't on it, concrete and a barbecue and mobile lights, we didn't even have lights there. 150 of the worst kids will gather there because there is a connection with hum other human beings who will feed, who will nurture, who will talk to them. There's one suburb there I'm about to join in. It's the police commander said, three streets in that suburb cause all the crime in this suburb. Simple. I'll go and set up a barbecue and we'll talk to these kids and we'll empower them, give them education, and we'll turn suburbs around. So it's very simple. Youth want to engage with adults. As I said, our research says it's the mums in research at the moment who, has, who is the the hero for kids. We all think it's a footy star who's out there smashing people up and then drinking and you know, Australia getting involved in all sorts of terrible stuff. And, um, but in kids' minds, they're not. It's our perception. So kids are just wanting to connect. They want to talk. And you talk to kids, what do you want most from your parents? Time, time, be around them, talk to them. And the biggest indicator we have of a kid not being a drug addict or alcoholic is the amount of time he or she will spend with mum and dad. They're talked to, they're listened to, you know them. It's the kids who don't have that connection that will do crazy things. Now, I'm not saying, because I know there's some, maybe a person in this room thinking, well, I did the best I could and the kid went off the rails. Yeah, that, that happens too, when you can't explain something. But generally, good kids are kept good by being connected to their parents, and that's really important. We've got to get a message out because I don't know in New Zealand, in Australia, we think adolescents don't want to be around us. They do, and we need to get that happening. And just connecting with kids uh, is, is really reduces crime and antisocial behaviour. We push them away from us. In your newspapers, I guarantee there's probably never one good story about kids. You'll hear all the worst of the worst. You won't hear that my kids will look after disabled kids. You won't hear that my kids go to East Timor or Archer or wherever. You don't hear those stories because people, uh, journalists, won't print them. And we need to change that even, change the culture of, the, of, that, of journalists and media. Uh, we, we prevented the extra riots happening in Macquarie Fields because the media trust us so much they didn't come in. If they had come in on that certain day, they, at the first anniversary, there would have been escalation. But because we've done good stories beforehand, so you can change if you're really fair dinkum and respond to media all the time. But getting good stories out there and counteracting politicians, I don't know if you have in Australia, we will lock them up for longer. Bob Carr, my good mate, will say, we will build three more jails this year. So I'd be on the radio the next day saying, Bob, build three every year. Because with that mentality, you'll increase the number of people in jail. People are made worse by being in jail generally, so there'll be more and more criminals, so three every year with that approach of tough law and order. Having said that, you'll also hear me in Australia say this. Child abusers and repeat violent offenders, keep them there for life. Never let them out, because they will do it again, particularly child abusers. 
So I take that tough line there. But when it comes to kids, do everything in our power before jailing them. And again, I try and be evidence-based. You probably think I'm being a pain in the neck being evidence-based. But when you say stuff, you've got to have it backed up. And certainly research shows that the biggest indicator of a kid going in and out of jail for life is putting him there in the first place. If you find other ways of getting, if that young Ben, if we hadn't fixed him, he would have killed. I was sure of it. That day when he was in rage and he was going to the teacher saying someone's going to die, he would have killed. But because we spent time churning him around, he's now got an apprenticeship, it not only saves the government millions of dollars, but actually gets a kid back on track. And, and it, I, it might sound trite, but I find kids so easy to engage. You just be upfront with them, you just go directly to them. Kids tell me anything because I ask a straight question. Even women tell me everything. I'll say, how old are you? And they say, <laughs> people don't normally ask that. I say, well, I, don't like, I ask abnormal questions. And you're so confronted, you, you just blurt it out before you have time to think about it. And that's really an, an important way of engaging kids. Um, when I tell kids off, people have studied me, I'll come up and tell you off. You know when kids answer you back? I've already gone before the kid's opened his mouth and you think, you just blasted me, I'm about to tell you off, and he's not even there anymore, he's walked off and turned away. So there are good ways of engaging them. Tomorrow I'll speak a bit more about the, um, not the experience aspect, I will bring that in as well, but I'll talk about some other topics that I think are pretty important. Racism is one of those. I, I feel where's a nation, where's a world, I need to fix racism and pretend and stop pretending that it's an issue. It's a major issue in our country anyway. I don't know about yours, but and you're miles ahead with the um, with your First Nation uh, people. Our our First Nation people have just got the first apology from the new prime minister. So we're really treated them bad. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well tomorrow. So thank you. Is that okay? Thank you.